welcome back. I'm going to be explaining how First Tech Challenge tournaments work in this video. This is for NorCal or for other regions that have the qualifying tournament regionals system. For rookies or even for experienced teams, navigating tournaments can be challenging. So here are some things to remember the day of. Your engineering notebook first off and your robot. Then your robot controller and driver station phones and chargers, or if you have a control hub, then your driver station phone and charger and your control hub. You're also going to want to make sure that you've updated your phones to the latest version. Uh, that's not something you want to figure out at the tournament that you have to do because it can last a long time and mess up your code. You should also bring your batteries and chargers for the robot itself, protective glasses for everyone on the team since you'll need them in the pits, any tools you need to fix the robot, you never know what could break, but don't bring power tools. Computers for software team, you never know what code will break. A self-inspection checklist, because you don't want to discover that you can't pass inspections on the day of. Um, extension cable, which is optional, but really helpful to plug in all your chargers and your computers. Um, snacks and water, you don't want to get caught with needing to order pizza during lunch and having no time for it. Closed toed shoes, definitely a must. The control award application, if you're going to apply. Um, team shirts and swag is generally something that's good to have, just to, you know, show a little bit of extra spirit, but it's definitely optional. And your team poster would be another good thing to have to show off to the judges, but also not necessary. Okay, now onto the schedule of the day itself. So pits open first, and then there are inspections, which can last much longer than they say because most inspectors try to get all of the teams to pass inspections. So it can take hours if one team is completely against regulations. Inspections has two parts. There's the field inspection and the robot inspection. So you have to make sure that your robot can run a path autonomous on the field and not damage it, as well as make sure your robot actually fits all the requirements, like being within the 18 inch cube, weighing less than a certain amount if that's a requirement that year, having no sharp corners, etc. Try to get your robot inspected as soon as possible since it might take a while. And you might not pass, who knows, maybe your corners are too sharp. At the same time as inspections will be interviews. This is where you get a chance to present your robot, engineering notebook, and outreach. This is where judges decide if you're a candidate for awards, so try to prepare a presentation. They will also ask questions, so have some answers ready to, for anything that you think they might ask. Last year, and typically, you get five minutes for a presentation and five minutes for the judges to ask questions, so keep that in mind. Then there's the driver's meeting, which is just standard rules and procedures, but you should send your drive team to attend. Next is the opening ceremony, which is where they will play a few videos, explain the day a bit, and release the match schedule. This is when the action begins. However, be aware that judges will be going around the pits to interview award candidates in more detail during the matches, but before lunch. You should have some knowledgeable team members in the pits ready to answer questions if they come. You should also have a pit crew of people to fix broken parts or code and tighten screws between, between matches. The first active stage of a tournament is the qualification matches. These determine your ranking, and each team plays the same amount of matches paired with random team and against two other random teams. When the schedule comes out, it usually looks something like this. Highlight your matches like we have in here to make sure you can talk to your alliance partners to figure out strategy and autonomous cap compatibility. You may also want to figure out who you are playing against just to be extra prepared. Now, onto the specifics of the matches. You probably know how to score in the 30 second autonomous period and in the two minute driver controlled period, which also includes a 30 second end game. But you may not know how this applies to your ranking. All of those points contribute to each match's tiebreaker points and ranking points. Ranking points, or RP, are fairly obvious. They tally whether you won, tied, or lost, and are the main deciders in rank. If you win, you get two ranking points, or two RP. If you tie, you get one, and if you lose, you get zero. The scoreboard generally shows the up-to-date ranking, but remember that the RP is averaged, so if they only have played one match, it might not be very accurate yet. You can check how many matches they've played by looking at the column labeled plays. The ranking is not final until everyone has played five matches, or however many is at your tournament. 
Okay, now the second of the two tiebreaker points are generally the less understood. They're essentially tiebreakers, as the name indicates. Now, tiebreaker points, or TBP, is how much the opposing alliance scored. So it's not how much you scored, it's how much the opposing alliance scored. But it doesn't include penalty points. So if you score 200 points and the opposing alliance scores 50 points, you get 50 tiebreaker points. If the other team has a total score of 100 points, but they got 10 penalty points, then you get 90 tiebreaker points, not 100. If two teams have the same amount of ranking points, the team with the higher tiebreaker points gets the higher rank. Okay, so let's say you know what your ranking is. Now what happens? First off, there's the alliance selection. This is where the ranking is very important since the top four teams get to choose their alliance partner. If it's a single tournament, meaning it has around 16 teams, then the top teams can only choose one alliance partner each. If it's a double or triple, meaning around 32 teams and above, then the top teams each choose two alliance partners. Some teams choose alliance partners based only on the ranking, but there are some problems with this because individual teams' performances are often affected by their randomly selected partner and opposition. This is why we recommend scouting teams individually. This just consists of recording how many points they score individually or how they help the other robot score points. We use a Google form and sort the results to see who does best in each category, like this. You can see the different categories have different teams that do the best and we have to decide which one would complement our abilities the best. This requires a lot of people watching the matches and recording the points, so many teams don't have this sort of data. This is where the social aspect comes in. If you're not in the top four teams, you have to talk to the representatives of the top four teams to try and show your capabilities and see if they will pick you. If you are top part of the top four, you may want to talk to protective picks to tell them what you want and see them on the practice field or learn what path their robot can take and if it works with yours. A team can only select a team of lower ranking to join their alliance. So number three can't pick number one, but number one can pick number three. If teams from the top four join an alliance together, everything ships up. So for instance, if number one picks number two, then number three suddenly becomes number two, number four becomes number three, and suddenly, a team that wasn't on the list, the fifth ranking team, becomes in part of the top four and they can pick their own alliance partner now. If a team picks another to be their alliance partner and the pick team says no, they can't be part of any other alliance. So if you're not part of the top four, you should probably say yes if you want a chance at finals. Wow, that's a lot, but it's all important stuff. Now, after alliance selection, there's a short amount of time where you should probably test your code and driving with your alliance partner. But performance on the field is not the only way to advance. Awards can get you a ticket to regionals too. After the finals is award selection, where they announce who won what. For the main awards, like inspire, think, motivate, design, etc., one team wins the award and there are two runner-ups. Your team is eligible for all awards automatically, except for the control award, which you have to apply to to be eligible for. Once the awards and the finals have been determined, these go to your region's website, which show who advanced. The awards and positions that almost always advance you are the host team, the winner of the Inspire Award, and the captain of the winning alliance. However, if a team wins multiple qualifying awards, like if they are the captain of the winning alliance and they win Inspire, the ticket to regionals can pass down to the next team. This also work for, works for multiple tournaments. If a team wins Inspire in one tournament, then hosts another tournament, their ticket can pass down since they only need one to advance. However, this makes who advances from a tournament unpredictable. So if you're not sure whether you advanced or not, make sure to check regularly. That's how tournaments work in the Qualls Regional System. Thanks for watching, and I wish you the best of luck.